Seems like it's getting worse. The black issue in this nation. Is it getting worse or is it just being revealed, uncovered? So I kind of look at it like it's a disease, like a disease. Um, and it is a disease. The, the issue that we have in this nation, it never went away. The disease was, we caught the disease we brought the Africans here for slavery. And, uh, and maybe the disease started even with the Native Americans, the genocided Native Americans. And, and so uh, slavery, a couple hundred years, and civil war, and freed the slaves, but still injustice, continued injustice, lynchings, murders by civilians, by the authorities. Black Wall Street, people, when you find black folks with stuff, you know, entrepreneurial, making money, being successful, taken away, murder them, take their stuff. I, I just saw recently on the news, there's this family in California that's, that, ha, that were very, very successful and very wealthy. And, and the authorities found a way in collusion with the KKK to take away everything that they had kill some of them, run them out of town, poor and destitute. And, and now they're suing, trying to get back some of what was stolen from them. In addition, what they would have had had they had maintained and invested. Hope it works out for them. So this, this is our nation. And so what we're experiencing today with the George Floyd case is, as, as every black person probably knows, and most people honestly know deep inside as well, that the George Floyd case was simply the case that was caught on, caught on video. And it was an eight-minute torture, which, which ended in his, his, um, him expiring. He was choked out, asphyxiated for the entire world to see for eight minutes, the entire world but me, and I'm sure other folks, I just had, I never watched it. Just like I never watched when Al-Qaeda cut that American's head off. Many people watched that. I didn't watch it either. I don't see them as being any different, evil. But, but so, so what I'm suggesting is that it's not that things are worse now or things that have just progressively gotten worse from a certain point in time necessarily. I believe things are just being revealed. The illness is simply manifesting its symptoms for all the world to see, for us to see personally our own illness, an illness that had always been there, but is just more visible at the moment. As we know that before George Floyd, there have been scores and scores of black people murdered by the police, murdered by regular citizens and exonerated. So this is not imprisoned. So, so, so this is nothing new. But what I think it's very important for us to recognize is that we've been very fortunate in this nation that, that the black folks, the people of color that have been persecuted, have been rather subdued. Yeah, we get, the complaint is often made, well, how come the violence? How come the violent protests? Well, how do they burn down buildings and all this stuff? But how many people have been murdered in these protests because of the anger of these people of color for the injustices and oppression that's been perpetrated upon them? Probably almost none. And, and so what I'm reminded of as, as, hey, you know, I'm a student of Sun Tzu, the art of war as a martial artist for many, many, many years, and as well, not just the martial artist. See, see, you know, let's deviate a little bit. We look at MMA today. I like to watch MMA. But these guys, and these guys, I love to watch it. I would never do it. I mean, I've fought in many karate tournaments, you know, the regular stand-up karate tournaments and all, but I'd never do that MMA stuff, you know. It's kind of harsh. And besides that, I couldn't have another man's butt up in my face. <laughs> You just can't be cool. That's why the martial art. We were all like students of Bruce Lee. You know, we're gonna be cool. That was part of it. You know, you can't be cool like that. But but anyway, um, as as a martial artist, I just wasn't into the martial the the fighting aspect, which I loved. I I think I really loved the fight. Let me just reiterate. I I did love the fighting part of it. That's pretty. But but what I also incorporated. Let me put it that way. Was the philosophy. And so I studied a lot of Chinese philosophy 
Greek philosophy, different philosophies, but especially Chinese, and, uh, and strategies, Sun Tzu, the art of war. I'm a disciple of Sun Tzu, I consider myself. If, if someone were to rattle off you know, something and say, this is part of Sun Tzu's art of war, I could tell you right off if he's telling the truth or not, because I'm, I'm, I'm that much of a student. Okay? But there's one particular strategy that Sun Tzu revealed called fighting on death's ground. He's, and he's speaking in, in a situation where the men are on a battlefield and where there is no hope of winning. They're all going to die. When, when men have come to terms with the fact that they're going to die, they fight with a ferocity, with an extreme ferocity. Okay, and that's fighting on death's ground. And, and what I'm sharing today is that, that right now black folks are pretty close to being on death's ground. The death's ground is like hopelessness believing a situation will never be resolved. When you come to that point, you're fighting on death's ground. And that's when you become ferocious, extremely ferocious. See, in this nation, we've had, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, in the 60s, and uh, he was nonviolent, marching, you know, pleading for the right to eat at the lunch counter, you know, just wanting things to be equal and all. And, and so his strategy at the time was nonviolence, even nonviolence when violence is being perpetrated upon you. Don't fight back. Don't hit back. There's a story about Condoleezza Rice, her dad. Her dad was in, in that moment, you know, and the civil rights leaders knew Condoleezza's dad. But, and, and she quips often that they would tell him to stay home. They didn't want him part of their rallies, part of their marches, because he was a man that if somebody swung on him, he was going to swing back. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not the strategy. It, it was not that Martin Luther King Jr. was necessarily a pacifist. But Martin Luther King was an educated man. And he was educated enough to realize that a violent confrontation with the United States government, as, as justified as it might be, would end up in defeat. Okay, And, and so his, his plan, his feeling, was that this nonviolence yeah, and getting the nonviolence recorded you know, on, on cameras and on video. And, and being broadcast all over the world would bring a shame to this nation, our nation, a nation that was out and about, you know, proclaiming how good our system of government is, you know, and comparing ourselves against the communist threat and the communist takeover. I mean, a lot of our, our, our exploits in the other nations and the battles that we've had, like Vietnam, Korea, those, those were really, we really didn't care one way or another about which people we were supporting, Vietnam, North or South, but the bottom line was it was a it was a chess game that we were fighting against communist China, communist Russia, using the Vietnamese people as well using the Korean people. So so these are the places you know these are the battles that we are constantly in is really trying to portray to the world what a better system of government we have. So Dr. Martin Luther King's strategy was is if we're just showing the entire world how these nonviolent people are being tremendously beaten by the authorities and other citizens of this nation, our nation would be so embarrassed, we'd have to respond, okay? And, Martin, and, and as, you, as you follow the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, at, he got it, the situation so exacerbated his emotions that he was to the point of even considering that we just might very well need to fight back, okay, toward the end. But, but so he was on this nonviolent kick, please, pleading, uh, desiring equality, reasoning, and all that stuff, right? But, but at the same time, Martin Luther King was in doing his nonviolent thing. We had the Stokely Carmichaels out there. You know, we had a lot of rough Malcolm X. You know, we had a lot of rough brothers out there that weren't really uh, w ready to satisfy. Stokely Carmichael was a gentleman who coined the phrase black power. Malcolm X was the ballot or the bullet guy, you know what I'm saying? So, so it came to a point where we, we had the, the nonviolence trying that approach, then trying the violent approach, and, and we ended up with the Black Panthers, the Black Panthers for Self-Defense, whose initial purpose was simply to protect the oppressed residents of Oakland, California, who were being manhandled and mistreated and abused by the Oakland police. And they became very effective. Very effective where you had, you had, you had uh, elements of the Black Panther Party in Europe, in Asia, you know, in Africa, you know, all over the world because of the influence. And, and what's very interesting is, you know, I know there's a lot of conflict be, of, of white, between white and black and, and taking issue with the Black Panthers 
uh, from you know the 70s and all. But 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 during that time, the the Black Panthers and and the coal miners, the white coal miners from West Virginia. I mean, they came into union because they recognized that that it was not should not be a battle against race against each other. It was an economic battle, and we the, and that they were all being oppressed by the government. Okay, and so what what's very interesting as well, and maybe the government takes notes from Sun Tzu is is that somehow the battle was turned against each other, even with poor folks, you know, like, like now. I mean, you're going to find certain folks not really willing to accept these election results with these big old signs from their champion in their yards, and, and the signs are, are more expensive and better than the homes that they're in front of, and they say, make America, was it ever great for you? You know, I don't know. So, okay, so let's get back. So, so we had the, the nonviolent pleading, and we had the violence and, and the black power, and seemed to be making some headway in certain communities. But then we had, uh, from a historical perspective, many of the black radical leaders were bought off. Jesse Jackson, some of those guys, <laughs> they, they were bought out. You know, here, here's some money. Act right, okay? They were bought out. They were, they were imprisoned. They were killed, you know, many of the black radical brothers. Uh, and, uh, and the drugs in the communities kind of just shut the whole movement down. But so we but we did go through those stages of nonviolence and then violence. And and so 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 we were kind of in a place of, I don't know, sort of like a holding pattern of injustice, but sort of undercover injustice. So successful black folks or middle class black folks, black folks that were doing kind of well, you know, taking care of their families, trying to invest some money, trying to make money. There are other black folks moving up in the business world, you know, in the military ranks and, of course, in the sports and in every aspect of life. And, and our ears were kind of dulled to the oppression and the cries of the poor black folks that were still uh, suffering through the injustice and the heavy-handed tactics of the authorities, okay? But, but, so, but the evolution then picked back up when, when, uh, when Ob Barack Obama became president. When Barack Obama became president, we saw, we saw this disease begin to take another turn. We saw the disease begin to manifest. We, we, saw, we saw the Speaker of the House uh, suggesting that, you know, we're going to make this man a one-term president, something unprecedented, simply because he was a black man. We had never seen a president so disrespected as Barack Obama by, by Congress people, by, by, and, and their influence into their constituents. And, and, and so, so we saw then that this disease that we may have somehow believed didn't quite exist so bad just began to manifest as symptoms when Obama became president. So, so the a disease was there. <laughs> he was the catalyst that helped bring it out, okay? And so we saw eight years, we saw a negativity coming up from a particular segment of our society that had ills toward black people, that had ills toward people of color, and, and began to be vocal about it and, and physical about it. And, and we found that President, after Obama left office, having been undefeated but filling out his two terms, the, the, the new administration began to, to cater to the, the, the hate-filled rhetoric, the hate-filled emotion, the negativity that that, that other segment of society was having for, for black and brown and other people, okay? And even to the point of being so emboldened that now even the police have, have even stepped up their atrocities toward black folks that they're coming in contact with George Floyd, George Floyd being one of the primary most visible re in recent history. And so, so what we have then is, is a steady, we, we recognize the, the evolution from nonviolent king to the radical brothers, then, then to the sort of the holding pattern. But then as it's picking back up, so now people are pleading, you know, please stop killing, you know. And, and even the Black Lives Matter movement that has taken a lot of heat trying to be labeled as sort of a, some kind of a domestic threat organization where we saw on January 6th the real domestic threat, you know, we have going on here. But, but, but Black Lives Matter, it wasn't always a movement. <laughs> it was simply a plea. It was a black mother whose son was laying there dead, lamenting. 
that, that black lives do matter. But, but that, that, that woman was scoffed at. The, the, the pleas were scoffed at. The lamenting was scoffed at. And, and the Black Lives Matter went from a plea to a statement. Black Lives Matter. Still being scoffed at. That, that which was a lament, that which became a statement, now became a demand. Black Lives Matter. At that point, Black Lives Matter became a movement. Okay? But if, if it had just been listened to, if it had just been empathetically embraced of, of a broken-hearted mother or a dad standing over their child, you know, that, that Black Lives Matter, if it had been a heart of empathy, we wouldn't even be in the position that we're in today. But there was no empathy. This was a full-blown illness by now, and that's where we are today. And my, and my, my concern is, and even as I introduced Sun Tzu's fighting on death ground, when, when black folks have finally come to, I mean, this has been a long time, a long time coming, 400 years. You have fighting in the Civil War, expecting after that there'd be freedom and equality. There wasn't. Spanish-American War, you know, freedom and equality, but there wasn't. You know, fighting against the Indians, the Native Americans, freedom and equality, there wasn't. Fighting in World War I, scores of black folks fighting and killed in World War I thinking there would be equality. There wasn't. World War II, the same. Korea, Vietnam. Now, Afghanistan, Iraq. Still, we're in the same mess. When you come to a point of hopelessness, that, that would equate to the death ground that Sun Tzu was referring to. When you come to a place where people believe that there is no recourse, that there will be no wellness, that all is hopeless, all is lost. Fighting on death ground with an extreme ferocity. And, and what I'm suggesting today is we haven't seen death ground from black Americans in this nation. We, we've seen basically, you know, to the culmination of protesting and burning some stuff down but still with, with, a, with a reserve, with a holding back. But, but what I want to share with you, Sun Tzu's death ground, if, if, if that door is ever opened, there are going to be the people who caused the situation are going to be wishing that door was closed. And, and at that time, it'll be too late. And, and see, there's a secret. There's a secret that I know that many people don't realize, but I know. It's, it's that, that, that it, there's, a, there's an Asian saying that an empty wagon makes the most noise. That, that when you see all these, and we saw them, we saw them on January 6th, all those so-called patriots, all dressed up, playing dress up, all in their patriotic garb, red, white, and blue, some military um, outfits and all this stuff, all crazy acting and everything. They look like a mob. They look like a violent mob. Like they, they could really do some damage, but what happened after they got arrested? They're crying, snotting, crying. I want to go home. I don't know why I'm being treated so bad. My business is failing. The people who work for me are losing their... All these crimes, man, they got like 700, at least by now, people that are facing federal charges. They're crying about it. Because they weren't really strong. They weren't really warriors. They weren't really patriots. They weren't anything. They were just talking. When I see patriots, I see people like Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. I see people like Dr. Martin Luther King, I, I may not get there tomorrow, I may be killed, I may not get there with you, but I'm with you in spirit. That, that, that are willing to put their lives on the line recognizing that their cause is just and they might very well die, but that's okay. Because look, these guys, come on, aren't like that. They're weak. You know why they hunt deer? <laughs> because... Deer don't shoot back. And that's why so many black folks are getting killed so often because it's expected that black folks aren't carrying weapons. Now, now look, a couple, about two years ago, this is a story, a pretty good story, about two years ago, my, my wife, my child, and I decided we were going to go to Canada. And we had never been to Canada. I mean, we'd gone to the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, Dominican Republic. We're always going places. But we wanted to take a real short couple day of uh, vacation and, uh, and Canada. So I didn't want to go at first because, you know, international. I want to really travel. But, okay, I'll go. We'll go. So we drove up there. 
Man, it was a beautiful place. I love Canada. <laughs> the people were nice. It's amazing. Some of the food wasn't quite, you know, something is not what I'm used to, but uh, but the people were just really nice. Um, about we, so we were there, came back, and uh, got back to Dayton, and I decided it was early Sunday afternoon, and I was going to cook out. So uh, I took my wife and child home, and then I went up to Myers, Myers over on uh, in Inglewood. And uh, dropped them off at the house. I'm at Myers, and I'm sitting in the parking lot. Nice sunny day, and I got the windows down. I'm in my truck, and I think Santana was on. Really cool song. So I was gonna just wait till the song was over. I'm just listening to it, and 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 I happen to look up, and there was this guy. There was this white guy, tall white guy, country looking white guy, with his woman, girlfriend, wife, whatever. And he was just looking at me, all harsh and scowling at me, you know. And I just, oh well, and I just kept doing what I was doing. I really didn't pay him that much attention. But the whole way, he just was scowling at me. But I just, for what, I was in a different world. I was just listening to Santana, just enjoying it. But anyway, I, after the song was over, I went into Myers and was walking around in there. And then I saw him, and he had a gun on his, on his holster. And I realized at that moment, that's why he was scowling at me. He wanted to start, thought he was going to start some mess, and he was ready. He didn't know I had my 9mm sitting right next to me. <laughs> he would have been really surprised. But, but I'm saying is that, that when, when folks don't believe you have the ability to fight back, that emboldens them, okay? So, sort of like the Russian and American arms race, you know? I mean, we, we got to have just as many nukes as they have. They got to have just as many nukes as we have. Now, suppose Russia had nukes and we didn't. What do you think the result would be? <laughs> you know! Because they know that you don't have what they have. And, and so that's the situation we have today. That's not bravery. That's, that's not being brave. That's just the opposite of being brave. When you're all bad and tough and everything because you think you're armed and they're not. Man, that guy would have been sorely surprised <laughs> that day in the Myers parking lot. So, so the, the point I'm making is these guys are not brave at all. I remember back in the 70s. <laughs> I mean, come on. They weren't brave. Always afraid. Always thought a black guy carried a knife, you know. Always thought I had a knife. I did, but I mean, they always thought I had one, is what I'm saying. And so, so, so that's why you got to pry their cold, dead hands off those guns. Because they're never going to let go of them guns. Because that has given confidence. And, and so... Uh, we, see, we saw with the January 6th insurrection, the result of it after they're being prosecuted, how they're crying, <laughs> how they're begging, how they're apologizing, how they're cutting deals, telling on people, come on, man, give me liberty or give me, come on, let me go home with my mama, <laughs> come on. So, so just realize that. Just, just realize what we're dealing with. So these are the people I'm telling you. That, that if it ever comes down to death's ground, when black folks finally realize these folks aren't ever going to act right, that's a door that folks eventually are going to wish was never opened, and it will be a door that will not be closed. So, so I'm just suggesting, I'm just suggesting that before it gets too late, we just need to wise up. I mean, just be real with ourselves. <laughs> recognize that we're all human beings, okay, and, uh, and that we need to act right. Because there's an old saying that uh, what goes around comes around. It really does. And, and right now, I, I, I'm pretty comfortable in my life. I would rather not have any complications, <laughs> okay? So we should all just sit back, do some introspection, and figure out how we can come out of this thing peacefully and start acting right. How's that? That's it. Well, I guess I've touched on a few things today. I uh, hope I haven't bored you too much, given you something to think about. And, and I